Hola a todos desde Singapur, a los que están de este lado del mundo, buenas noches y buenos días a todos en Argentina. Soy Benedicta Badía, miembro del Comité Internacional de Arte Bar y en nombre de esta institución quiero darle a todos la bienvenida al tercer Open Forum Live de Arte Bar. Continuamos con esta iniciativa de Fundación Arte Bar para compartir este espacio de encuentro y debate entre figuras líderes del mercado artístico local e internacional para pensar cómo será nuestro futuro después del COVID-19. There you go. Good evening, everybody. Good morning. For the past months, due to the pandemic, the art world has been called for a long due and much needed soul searching process. It is not when we open, it will be how we open the art world again. But this call is extremely unfair to those who have already been concentrating and producing significant in-depth content. Arteva Open Forum presents the leaders of four of the most relevant, independent and contemporary art projects worldwide. We will learn why it is important to empower and support them, and now more than ever. I would like to make a note that all four of these projects are non-for-profits. So we're going to dis describe Pivot, Delfina, Parasite, and the Dakar Summit as those who, with their acts of creation driven by desire, try to convert, revert, pervert, subvert, deprogram, deinstall, deestablish, deconfigure, defetichize, disarm, undo, take down, empty, or simply quit the colonial unconscious. In an effort to raise awareness to the lengths to which we are still influenced by imperial colonial narratives, we will introduce the four panelists highlighting the original language used in their country and the imposed one. So the first panelist is Diana Campbell Betancourt, Artistic Director of the Sandami Art Foundation and Chief Curator of the Dhaka Art Summit. For the past months, Diana has been stranded in Bali, in Indonesia. So in Bahasa, we're going to say Selamat Malam to all our Indonesian friends. Diana? Good night. I guess I can see you can hear me. Uh, I'm here uh, in Bali. And um, my family comes from Guam, which was a former Spanish colony. So like you guys in Latin America, we say buenas noches to say good night. Um, and in Bangladesh, where I work, uh, the way to say good night is shuvaratri. And our common language between Bangladesh, Guam, United States, and Latin America would be English. So good night. <laughs> our second panelist is Cosmin Costinas, executive director and curator of Parasite in Hong Kong. The native language in Hong Kong is Cantonese. So, I have to read it. <laughs> Jiao Tao to all our Hong Kong friends. Kosmin? Jiao Tao. Uh, and um, I'm originally from Romania, and the way to say uh, good evening is Buenos Aires. No. Okay, let's continue with the others then. Our third uh, panelist is Aaron Caesar, director of Delfina Foundation based in London where English is a native language. You know? <laughs> Good evening to all our UK friends. <laughs> so hello everyone, I'm Aaron Cesar, but I'm from the United States. And you know, in the US, of course, there have been many multiple native languages, but English is the imposed language. In fact, my family spoke Creole, but as I am in the UK right now, I'll say good afternoon to you in the imposed language here, English. <laughs> And last but not least, Fernanda Brenner, founder and artistic director of Pivot in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Boa noite to all our Brazilian friends. Fernanda? Hello, uh, boa noite. Uh, yes, um, I'm, uh, like the US, Brazil is um, carrying on like multiple uh, indigenous language, native language, but uh, the the imposed language is Portuguese, so bom dia for everybody. And I'm, I'm originally from Brazil and so I speak Portuguese, as often well my family. And I am from Argentina uh, as well. We had several multiple languages, um, and, uh, but the, our imposed language is Spanish. 
Uh, so as we said before, these are the these guys were the ones who were getting it right before the virus. We would like to dimension the complexity of the four of the, these four projects projects and what they entail. So between the four of them, I'm going to read the amount of things they do. They do artist residencies, contemporary art centers, exhibitions, new art commissions, publications, curations, both in-house or for others, family lunches, paid studio visits, health care for artists, workshops, performances, performance as a process program, collecting as a practice program, science and technology program, art summit, art investigation, thematic uh, programs such as politics of food or public domain, Mahasa program, that it means modern art histories in, acro in and across Africa, South and Southeast Asia, educational public programming, conferences, collabor collaborative co group exhibitions, art awards, art summit, experimental writing initiatives, idea incub incubators, curatorial training programs, annual international art conferences, film and talk programs, professional development of cultural practitioners, and they partner and collaborate with other institutions worldwide. And most importantly, they are human beings, they're generous, <laughs> and they're community-oriented, and I'm exhausted for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> So our first trigger, our first question, um, of course, we're going to talk about what we were, our past and our future. Uh, we've said everything, we've heard the past two months, everything under the, the sun and more have been said. So we're going to quote Suelin Rolnik again. Uh, and her quote is, the most important and access successful orientation, operation of the Western modernity culture including colonization, is the anesthesia of the knowing body and the obstruction of our access to sensations, tensions, in order to affirm the ethical, political, cultural function of thought, thought that has become submitted to consumerism. If we guide ourselves by this quote and think of what we had become pre-COVID, the art world had become pre-COVID, it looks like the art world was in a really, really bad shape. We were intensely globalized. We were urged to travel more and more. We, had, we were connected with brand names and blockbusters. We were going to swanky dinners and cocktails. F few players were at the top of the system. Art was measure, measured by its market and value. And institutions lacked scrutiny. The four of you on these four projects have been able to stronghold the identity and relevance of your projects. You were able to remain genuine. You carved your own path in the art eco ecosystem while being able to successfully serve the mainstream. How do you survive? What is essential to your projects? What makes you so unique? What is the role of community and generosity in your, in your projects? And where does the magic come from? So Cosmin, you have the stage. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> <laughs> having us all here and for your uh, very, very generous introduction and words. I think uh, I can speak on behalf of my colleagues and friends. That I think we're all humbled uh, by your uh, um, introduction and, and recognition of, um, I think, the communities and the teams that lay behind all our works uh, here. Um, where does the magic come from and where, you know, you, you, you mentioned the words generosity and the words community. And I think these are the two main words that, um, that are behind magic. They're behind reality. They're, they're, they're behind the need of everything that we should be doing at this point. Um, and I think we had, uh, previous conversations with you and, and, uh, you know, you did bring up explicitly that you wanted us to talk about uh, what happens besides the program, what happens besides the thing that we're uh, offering one, one way or another. And I think it is exactly that um, basic understanding that should be taken for granted, but indeed it, 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 it has largely been forgotten by so many of us actually, like, you know, before, before this crisis that uh, we work with, 
artists, we work in an economic system. There's a need to support the people that we work with. That we have a relevancy for, to a community and we have a, we have a responsibility towards a community. Um, you know, we all have our own subjectivities. We all like to curate. We have ideas. We want to do things, you know, being, being brought to life. But uh, we can't do any of this if we don't establish responsible systems for things to be produced, to, to, for, for things to be shown, for things to be mediated to an audience. Uh, and I think it's important to, to uh, place that at the, at the, at the, at the very um, forefront uh, of, of the new reality that we're building together. Um, I mean, specifically just to, to mention what we've been doing and, and, you know, we, being in Hong Kong, we were in, 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 in a peculiar position. We were affected by this crisis earlier than most places. Mm. Um, but it also meant, well, and, and as well as the, the major community effort in Hong Kong to, to wear masks and to, you know, really be responsible towards everyone uh, in, in, in our community. So this meant that we were able to open safely uh, sooner than, than, than other places. So we continued with our program. We continued with we open uh, um, an exhibition. Uh, but we also realized that there's other things that we should be doing urgently. Um, and that's how we started the, the Pay Studio Visits, which was a, uh, an immediate response to the crisis in, into which the artist community in, in uh, Hong Kong found uh, itself in. And, and that's surely the case with, with artists all around the world. That, uh, you, you, know, the, the you, you mentioned about health, health you know how important it, you realize health system health well so this care. is something that we actually did uh, you know without knowing that the, having any prior information of like what would happen uh, this year but this is something that we started uh, from first of january but we, we 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 you know we planned it a few months even before the crisis uh, uh, you know, appeared in China, but we started uh, offering a, a system of, of, of health insurance to all the artists that we're working with. We were obviously offering to everyone um, um, artist fees, uh, everyone who, who, who is part of our exhibitions, who's, uh, you know, part of our residency, our talks, our public programs, gets an artist fee. And, um, you know, so, so do all our interns. So everyone is paid for the work that they're doing. Uh, but we added to that for Hong Kong based artists starting this year a health insurance. So for the period into it, for, for the period of exhibitions, if they're part of the exhibitions, but also for the period of preparation for works, or if it's a pre, pre existing work, uh, we did that retroactively as well. You know, that at some point in the past, you know, they would spend a few months uh, creating that work. So that adds up in the period that they're, that they're covered. So this came, came on quite handily, and I think that's, that's something that we'd like to, to talk about, you know, not so much to brag, but we, we really hope that this then becomes a model, that this becomes part of the culture, becomes part of a, a reference system. So, so you think, I mean, uh, all the projects, uh, I mean, there's an enlarged community from the, hand, the art handlers, the, the, you know, there's an enlarged community of people who were depending on on, the, on the, a lot of, you know, in the art market, um, on a lot of these projects, and suddenly these people, you know, don't have work. Um, so we do have to think as well um, in the, you know, enlarged community of, uh, of the art world. Um, Fernanda, what about you? What's happening with, uh, what's the unique, uh, what's happening in that Copan um, <laughs> building that's so magical? Uh, well, first of all, I take the, the opportunity to thank you, Bene, for bringing us all together and for the, the great uh, introductions. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, now it's uh, a voice is completely um, oriented towards its own site. Uh, for, for the ones that don't know, is, um, is this uh, large scale multi, multi use building in, the, in Sao Paulo, which is, uh, I would say, possibly the most important building in the city. And uh, for us, uh, having an institution there is, uh, is amazing because we have a potential building audience of 5,000 people. And they, wow. they, this, this doesn't mean that they come down often, but uh, we are, that's why I say potential. But, uh, but uh, uh, I think this, uh, what this crisis triggered is uh, we are always had uh, an urge to, to really think uh, about this very context, about how to engage the community. But now 
this situation is even more more complex because we are not uh, we are not able to open the space. And we what we did, um, uh, I think, like most of us, we shared this. Uh, I completely shared this idea uh, with Cosmin. Is that uh, we are all. Um, even more aware of the importance of thinking collectively and thinking of, of systems. Uh, and for, for the minute that we had to close down the, the doors in Pivo, we started to really redirect our, our funding, which is not near enough, to find a way to keep everybody in the staff working regardless of when and how we will be open to manage to open again. And also to, to really be engaged, not um, in our own program, but finding out how our existing structure could be uh, used to, to a better good. So, for, for example, what we did um, was a campaign that we didn't want to say is like a campaign by Pivot, with Pivot, but we, our team and our space uh, put together a campaign in the building itself to ask for donations for the homeless people around the, the area that were raising by the minute in Brazil. So, like, uh, for the minute... Uh, the city closed and the, and the pandemic uh, was more, more evident in the, in the country. It's like it's a week after we can see the, the immediate impact this has in, the, in the, 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 the people living in downtown Sao Paulo that were already uh, in, in a very precarious situation. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is like to not to really think about programming, but to think about what art can do and what an art institution can do in, with, within a systemic thinking. And uh, so we started to work first uh, in our most uh, immediate neighborhoods. And now, a few months after, we are trying to put together all sorts of support systems for the artists and for, and for the, the people that we, we impact more or less directly within uh, uh, the program. So, yeah. For the, uh, for the ones who don't know, um, Pivo is next to Dona Onza, <laughs> but I think yes. it's one of the most best Brazilian food uh, restaurants. Um, it looks like the, the connection with the community, the large community in all the projects. I've seen the case of Silverlands in the Philippines. It's incredible what they're doing. Um, but it's also like I see that all of your projects are sort of like a safe haven of expression for artists you you get people together uh, even in the elevators in parasite uh, <laughs> but aaron you i think have mastered that that family that that nucleus of safe haven to pe for people to express can you tell us a little bit about it yeah, absolutely thank you again benny for bringing together so many uh, of my uh, beloved kind of colleagues from around the world, um, who I miss dearly because I feel like sometimes I see my art world family more than I see my actual uh, family. Um, Diana calls them, anyway. Diana calls them city, uh, what do you call it? Civilians. Civilians. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They are not from the art world, they are exactly. the civilians. <laughs> but the notion of family is something that's kind of like, you know, punctuated all of our work at Delfina Foundation. And I think you're probably referring mostly to our family lunches which has become a way to build networks of solidarity, but to also share practices of artists. But it started through a very kind of simple notion. You know, we have, we're an artist house, and we have up to eight artists living and working in the space. And it started with just the artists, you know, of course, cooking with each other in the evenings. And then soon we started to join them as staff. And then we decided, well, let's, we should invite you know, the patrons or the partners who supported the artists into this, this meal. And then it just became bigger and bigger, and then it became very strategic. We started to notice how networks of interests were coming out of the meals. Um, we had on many occasions where, you know, an artist would, would get their next commission through a family lunch, or a gallery would identify an artist, or a gallery would identify even a client, like through kind of patrons and, and collectors who would come to the meal. And I think for us, the genesis of these kind of communities coming together has proliferated all of our work. And in fact, uh, the notion of family lunch, of having these bi-monthly uh, events with about 30 people, it's always home cooking. But these events led into us creating a whole program around the politics of food. And thus far, we've had over 100 artists and residents in relation to 
the politics of food, several exhibitions, a number of commissions, and even a publication we produced recently kind of around this. And for us, I guess food then became a way of thinking about art, thinking about how you make these conversations accessible to civilians, to those who are out there, not just <laughs> thinking of art world, kind of like family. Um, but mostly important, it, it's built up kind of networks around the world, our work at Delfina, not just through food, but just through our work and a whole notion of family, to the point where, and I'm gonna connect a little bit with what Fernanda and Cosmo were saying, um, we were able to use a lot of our networks uh, in China, particularly through two of our very uh, incredible patrons, who have been sourcing protective equipment for the NHS here in the UK. They've sourced over 20 million pieces of equipment. So we have to reopen as, as the art sector here has to reopen. And we think about how we do that safely. Mm -hmm. And right now when our, all of our budgets are strapped, it's very important that we're able to kind of have access to this material and reopen kind of the art world. So, so there is a, a, a component where you direct, where you, do a framework, like, you know, an infrastructure, but there's a big, big component in all of your projects of, of let it be, of organic growing. Uh, and I think the queen of organic is Diana Campbell. <laughs> then <laughs> of letting people go and see what happens. So tell us what happens during a, at the Dakar summit. Um, especially, we know, we want to know a little bit about what happens in the hotel. That's a very, very interesting. Uh, um, <laughs> it's very peculiar. I have to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to say, I'm not allowed to say what happens in the hotel, but I'll tell you one. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you one. <laughs> no, but, but you put, no, I'll give you, you an anecdote. All, yeah, but you put all the curators. You put all the. I mean, it's it's basically you take over a hotel. We do, the and they actually get to, we do, and um, I think a very key part of our project, which differentiates us from a lot of biennials, is we don't burn the ground down and start from scratch. It's like we like to work with people over and over and over again and kind of build a stronger family. So whenever Aaron comes back to this hotel, how many times have you been to the hotel? Four times? Four. Yeah. Four? Four? They're like, Michael Jackson, you're back. Um, so they actually know people's <laughs> names. Yeah. Um, they know who my friends are. They tell me if like someone, uh, or even if someone tries to book the hotel themselves, they'll email me and ask me if that's someone I want in the hotel. I never thought I would have that kind of um, <laughs> <The queen. laughs> um, and, and it's not a fancy hotel. It's like, you know, maybe something no. like, what, what is it called? The, the, what's that Wes Anderson movie? The Grand Budapest Hotel or something like that? Anyway. Um, Point being, I think what is very special about the DACA Art Summit is that it's an iterative process of building things together. So I would say, you know, artists in Bangladesh have been active since, you know, even before it was a country. Um, they've made art institutions, they started their own biennial, the Asian Art Biennial, there's lots of interesting collectives, but it wasn't reaching other parts of the world because there wasn't a commercial system that was representing artists. And Bangladesh, unfortunately, gets a lot of negative press. So most things that people read is about poverty, floods, collapsing factory buildings. Um, so there are some uh, young couple, Rajiv and Nadia Samdani, who were patrons that were very inspired by the artists that they were encountering and wanted to do something that would allow others to learn about them in, within their own context. So I came in very early into the project and um, I guess my role is trying to build teams um, and narratives to weave stories from Bangladesh in with strands of thought and experiences that can draw up motifs that might have been obscured or overshadowed. Like the loudest voice in the room is usually the one that's heard. So if it's the British Council, and again, we're very grateful to the British Council, like it's going to be proliferating these colonial um, frameworks. So we thought it was really interesting. And I should also say when we started this, Nadia and I were in our 20s, right? So no one was listening to us. Um, but it was, a, um, you know, it was really a process of building something over time. Um, and this authority that we built, we're now like the highest daily visited art exhibition in the world. Um, when we got that statistic by the, by the art newspaper, it was 35,000 people a day. We hit 110,000 oh. people in one day this time. So we over like more than triple that um but uh and wait uh, sorry we we have to yeah. add that it's free for everybody uh, it's I was free there. We, we, yeah it's free for all bangladeshis and actually the art people were like excuse me do you mind i want to see that work it was completely took over by bangladesh uh, by dhaka citizens it was amazing 
Yeah, and I think that's something, you know, I really love, I don't know if, if anyone has seen the new Documenta 15 Instagram account, I highly suggest checking it out because I used to use the word inclusive as a way to describe this project, but they actually have an illustration that talks about the problem of that word inclusive. Who decides who's included? Um, so I wouldn't use that word anymore. Um, I would say that it's something that is participatory. There's something for everyone. Um, and this is, um, there's a way for anyone to participate. And that's just something that we built um, organically over time. And um, yeah, I don't, we don't see ourselves as an event. It's really a movement. Like so, and also I have to say, Cosmin, what you did with the paid studio visits, this is the first time I'm talking about it, but we're going to start this in Dhaka for our emerging Bangladeshi artists. Uh, we don't have health insurance like that in Bangladesh, but I thought that was an excellent example as to how can you support your local scene with emerging artists that aren't selling work, that don't have international shows, that aren't getting artist fees, while also helping curators like us who used to be on planes all the time to access this kind of work. And I don't know about all of you like I've been super happy being grounded for almost four months I mean I do want to go home but like it's uh, <laughs> um, you know I've never yeah. been in one place this long and it also just makes you um, feel your space in the world in a different way that's that we all need right like you to feel a season to feel climate change to feel lunar cycles it, it's important <laughs> Yeah, well, I think uh, called, when we talk with Cosmin, solidarity and this organic relationship and allowing, you know, allowance to, to create uh, a safe haven as well as we were talking. Uh, apparently, all of you have created that kind of magic. Uh, we still, uh, we're going to go back to the uh, elevator and the hotel <laughs> later <laughs> on. <laughs> Um, so, um, we're going to go to the next question. We have been talking a lot uh, about diasporas and forced migration the past years. Uh, Diana, you curated an amazing show in Azharkal um, about this. Uh, but yet, the four of you highly support withdrawing artists from the comfort of their own environment and trigger their creative process beyond their comfort zone somewhere, somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, Diana, for example, um, the Dakar Summit started as a South and Southeast Asia Summit, but you have shifted it to include what you call the global majority. And we are very happy that you have included Latin America. And we had a lot of Argentine artists uh, this year there. So why? Why did you do this shift? Uh, why is it so important for you that an artist, you know, goes somewhere else? I think you understand more of who you are when you have a completely external view, when you're taken out of that comfort zone, because you, you, you know, it kind of shakes you out of your skin and you have to reconsider where you fit in the world. But I had, um, and also I have to thank you, Bene, and, and um, for, for being so supportive, also Francis Reynolds and others, like to, to also try to make it possible for me to draw these connections. Um, but um, I had a really amazing conversation with Fernando Palma in Mexico. Um, and he was talking to me about how in the year 2000, he did a three month residency in Bangladesh. And he went and he met the Chakma indigenous community in the Chittagong Hill Treks, and it blew his mind that somewhere so far away from his regional context could be feeling the exact same issues. And so when we think about issues of colonization, of extraction, of um, conversion and obscuring of um, indigenous languages and cultures. I mean, this is all there in uh, South Asia as well. And um, I also think um, it's something that is personally important to me. How do I use the resources or agency that I have in a way that no one else is doing, right? So it's pretty, e I'm not going to say easy, but you know, there are national funding bodies to bring British artists, Swiss artists, German artists, um, Canadian artists uh, to places like Bangladesh, but there are no kind of formal funding sources to bring um, artists from uh, Central and South America to South and Southeast Asia outside of extremely generous patrons like the Samdanis or you or Francis. So um, I was also really moved by um, Antonio Diaz, who's one of my favorite um, artists from Brazil, um, spent a formative um, moment in uh, Nepal in the 1970s, which again was funded by a collector. But there have been these moments of exchange and how could I revive that? And I guess I have some of the language skills to be able to 
draw these connections. And it was so meaningful working with artists or like Daniel Stiegman Mangrene. We produced an amazing film with him in the art school of Dhaka, but also, you know, spending time in Parque Lage, spending time with him, seeing, you know, how, how interconnected these contexts are, but because it's so far, so expensive, and, um, you know, not everyone speaks, at, people in Bangladesh don't speak Spanish, not everyone in uh, Brazil will speak uh, English. So it, it's, it's been a pleasure to try to draw these connections, and I hope the pandemic doesn't stop this, because we're just at the beginning of that uh, journey. <laughs> So Aaron, um, Delfina, uh, you're based in London, so you're not operating from an emerging market, uh, yet you have your eyes 99.9% in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm not happy with that. It looks like you're, you're almost like a torturer person. <laughs> Delphine, you're, you're, you're not happy with that. Delfina since it doesn't focus only on artists, but on all the actors of the ecosystem. So if a resident comes to Delfina, He's, there's not going to be only artists. There's going to be all sorts of art practitioners. Then you forced um, the interaction between a, um, this variety of, of uh, um, practitioners, including art collectors, because you think art collecting is a practice. <laughs> and then you add a little bit more, a pinch of salt, where they all live together, they have to cook together. Um, and they, you create sort of a like non-hierarchical atmosphere. So what are the benefits of bringing a Latin American artist to Delfina? Like, what happens there? Well, I think that, you know, Delfina Foundation being based kind of in London, it kind of provides a space for us to kind of bring together artists from all over the world. I mean, in fact, one of my kind of, actually before the lockdown, one of our residency programs included a number of artists from Asia and from Latin America who may not normally meet because as you know, even in the art world, we may all be global. We may, not all of us are global, but those who are global, <laughs> who travel a lot, tend to travel in packs and often packs around kind of like practices. But at Delfina Foundation, it's this kind of space to kind of bring together and it'd be a bridge between all these different parts of kind of the, the, the kind of ecosystem. So for us um, in thinking about how we can utilize kind of our space, but also how we approach working with artists, which is through themes. And we think of these themes as being kind of mm -hmm. areas of research, of shared and common practice. Because often when artists are brought together from different places, it's, it's, it's based around this notion of cultural exchange, as Diana was, was hinting at. And therefore, there, can, there tend to be a, an imbalanced approach within that. It's focused on differences from where you are, rather than on similarities of what you, how you approach kind of the art world. So a lot of us think about being, creating kind of like a, a space of bedfellows, you know, like-minded individuals to kind of share practices. Now with collectors, and people always ask us and challenge us about this, because <laughs> I, 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 I do think that, you know, if you're gonna support the whole ecosystem, you have to also think about collectors, you know, who are, who also drive the art world in different ways. And they cut across both the nonprofit and the for-profit for, for profit world. And I think that just like one would say, well, there's under, underrepresented artists in the world, there's underrepresented collectors. Because underrepresented types of practices, like you, Binet, who are very interested mm -hmm. in research, you know, are collectors who are interested in performance, things that are not market-driven. And those who are trying to do something that's trailblazing, it's not about headlines, not about, you know, buying the most expensive painting or, uh, flipping works and auctions. It's really about the stories that these collections tell and the social value rather than the financial value of them. So at Delfina, we've been trying to create a space for like-minded individuals to come together regardless of kind of where they're situated in the ecology in order to develop the ecology. So let's go to Cosmin then. Um, Cosmin, you recently had an Argentine artist curator uh, resident in uh, Hong Kong, Santiago Villanueva. Santi has a unique approach to construction of the nat nation's art identity based on the orthopedic uh, as an artificial replacement of what is supposedly lacking in our nation's cultural production. And we can, you know, that definition can be applied so, to so many countries around the world. Um, and now in Parasite, in the group show Garden of Six Seasons, you have the work of Guatemalan artist Naufus Ramirez Figueroa. What were your thoughts when you invite a Latin American artist to Hong Kong? Why, how do you bridge that? You know, what do you think is going to happen? 
we actually have even more. So even in Garden of Six Seasons, we have like quite a bunch of, of, of Latin American artists. So even, even from Guatemala, we have uh, uh, actually two artists, Antonio Pichia as well. So we, 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 we do things in pack. No, 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 it's fine. You know, as, as Aaron said, we do things in pack. Um, look, I mean, thinking of this, I think there's, there's no other way. There's no other way than to work in this, in, in this way. You know, I, I, I think, you know, we're still presenting it as something that we could do as a merit, as, as, as a choice. We don't have a choice. I mean, if we are to be uh, true to our big statements of, creating community, being, uh, uh, you know, you know um, agents of, of, of um, constructing art institutions around an idea of shared international public sphere. All these things that lie at the core of how we define our work as curators and, and how we justify our ex existence as institutions can only be done in this way, can only be done if we indeed like think beyond uh, these geographies and we think we, we, we genuinely uh, leave aside centers of power uh, uh, um, as, as hegemonic structures as, as much as we can like with every single choice of who to invite who to include uh, who to associate uh, with whom uh, we need to be true to, to, to these principles that are there uh, this is the only way in which we can actually like, be relevant, and this is the only way to make things work um, in, 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 in the climate in which we find ourselves. So, sure, you know, I, we can talk here about the similarities and the, 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 the moments in which, the, the moments that happen when you have artists from indigenous backgrounds throughout Latin America encountering artists of indigenous backgrounds from different parts of Asia, for example, or um, artists who find themselves in a lineage of, of uh, working through dictatorship and resistance and, and, and finding themselves, or, or, or a younger generation, generation finding itself, you know, dealing with the advent of the market and, the, and, 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 and how that uh, reconfigured the global system of, of, of contemporary art in their own context. So, sure, these are arguments and, and, and for, for, for creating these kind of exchanges. But at the end of the day, you know, the, again, the only way to uh, achieve something of, of note in this bizarre, marginal, small, uh, but ambitious a uh, courtyard of, 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 our, <laughs> of our profession <laughs> with this very bizarre, you know, if you, if you read, if we make a few steps back and we think, you know, from a broader framework of, of society of like, what is an art institution? You know, what, uh, what place do they find themselves in the edifice of institutions, of structures that make a society working? Uh, you know, everything from police to uh, you know, museums of history to university, from universities to armies to, you know, to all these sort of like edifices that, that, that for better or for worse, uh, build the reality in which we find ourselves. What role can we play uh, genuinely? And how do we justify all the resources that are put or, you know, most often not put here? And I think, you know, we need to be ambitious and we need to be, you know, to, 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 to really push as further as, as, as far as possible these principles that we, that we, that we put forward to, to, to define our work and working globally, glo building a, a new form in, of, of internationalism is a reality that we have to live and we have to, 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 to build it um, because there's very few other uh, structures uh, in, in these days that actually do it. So mm. that actually... Yeah, it, it seems, yeah, questioning permanently. All of you are questioning permanently. It doesn't look like you just sit down and, you know, you're always looking for something new. <laughs> or... Cosmin, sorry. <laughs> I think we should question everything, yes. I don't know if we should always <laughs> but, look for something but, new. Yeah, but... Uh, per, no, but, then, but no, no, not new in, the, in terms of, like, like, not going, you know always doing the same thing you know it's just going uh, you know generating some kind of change Fernanda you're based in Brazil so you have the opposite of the <laughs> of Delfina um, Daca and uh, Aaron and uh, Parasite 
um, Brazil's, Brazilians have a very strong tradition of consuming, defending, and promoting their own art internationally. And all of Latin America envies them a lot because of that. Uh, and you had the possibility of going Brazilian all the way when you founded Pivo. Like Pipa, for example. Nobody would have failed, uh, faulted you for doing that. Why did you decide to do Pivo an international, uh, hosting international artists? Yeah, I think uh, this is this is a very interesting question, and I think it's very much um, I would say related to the moment uh, uh, Pivot opened, which was uh, 2000 and the end of 2011. So Brazil back then was in a very different situation than it is nowadays, and uh, I think uh, Pivot actually as an institution came out of a question actually for like besides the space itself, which is where do we go to meet artists? So I think I, I traveled a lot and I, I talked to a lot of people and people always ask me, where do I go in Sao Paulo to meet artists? And Sao Paulo is like a 22 million people city, very hard to navigate and uh, with a very, um, very intense and very, and very rich um, art um, practice. But very, back then was like, a, a, I felt like a lack of, uh, of uh, devices for dialogue uh, inside and outside the, the space itself. So PIVO, the name of the institution, PIVO is a pivot, it's like the central pin of something that turns. So I think uh, I relate a lot what, uh, with uh, what Cosmin just said about the, what an, ex an institution can actually do. And it took us a few years to use the word institution because it's very heavy word and people started, I would say, as an author's occupation, as actually out of a very, very specific demand of the local art scene, which was international dialogue, I think. So mm. I, for the very beginning, uh, Pivot uh, was conceived as a place to gather, a place where artists could rely on to pose questions, to develop work, to find solutions, to try and error, to all sorts of things. And in the end, this all came to we need to bring people in and send people out, which is what we do since 2013 with the residency. So I, I would say that um, we try to build a, an art practice uh, in which the local experiences and the global outlooks, they can coexist and interact uh, at all senses. But I would say that often we have a bias for the local and nowadays even more because uh, yeah. uh, of the, the, I think this is something that the, the pandemic is going to unavoidable bring us together i think uh, mm -hmm. as as we are saying in the this in the beginning of the talk like this uh, new urgency mm -hmm. on social consciousness and on creating support structures for the local scene and for us i think it's very important and this can be very uh, much achieved through uh, through the internet uh, and through conversations like we're doing now which is keeping i think the, the international outlooks, uh, which is, I think, for me, is, is crucial to, to the, the development and to the disclosure of the, of the local artistic community. So since the beginning of Pivot, everything we did, which is not a given in Brazil, everything we did was always translated to English. And, uh, and, and we translated English text to Portuguese and to create a common grounds. But uh, as we were saying again, also, respecting the individualities and respecting the localities. And I would say, I, I agree a lot with Diana that, uh, that the universal is a place of exclusion in itself. So it's like the situation that we have to always, um, whenever we bring somebody in and send somebody out, there's a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of ethical thinking uh, involved in that sense. So, so I think this is, uh, I would say this is what, uh, why people is, is uh, is an international space in the lack of a better word. That maybe we need I, to invent I, this new this new word for the, the new for the art world to come. <laughs> I, I love it because yeah. Diana talks about the summit, you talk about <laughs> circular and then about seismic movements. It's very yeah. interesting. And we, we talk uh, actually this is a conversation we had a lot uh, myself and Diana about finding ways to build bridges between South America and Southeast Asia, which is something that is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. To an, official, gonna, to, to, an official <laughs> to an official channel. So and it's, it's uh, very important. Our next question, we have a lot of young galleries uh, and artists listening. So our first question, I think it's very, our next question, I think it's very pertinent for, for you to answer for them. 
Uh, Fernanda, you recently curated a sector of Artissima, Fundamenta, with Ilaria Bonacosta. That was fantastic. Uh, Cosmin, you curated uh, Kanman, the Kanman, uh, no, sorry, you curated Woven and Freeze London, but also you were the artistic director of the Kathmandu Triennale. Then uh, you produced a major art summit in Bangladesh. Uh, and Aaron, you were in charge of uh, the opening and closing performance programs of the Viennale, uh, Viennale de Venezia. Uh, each one of you has to make a lot of decisions when you're doing, you know, encountering these uh, um, productions. Uh, whether they were curatorial decisions were intended for commercial or for um, non-commercial endeavors, um, I would like to know if, a gallery, if the gallery of the artist is a factor that, that works with the artist, is a factor you take into account when you make all your decisions. Are the galleries considered the vessel that um, contains the ethos of an artist's production or is the ethos of a gallery the context of an artist? And I'm thinking, for example, of galleries that, uh, that uh, operate more like the Indonesian collective uh, Ruan Rupa uh, than a traditional gallery. Um, so if it's yes, you take into account the gallery, please let us know why and what do you look for in the gallery? And if it's no, when you're choosing, um, also explain us why. So we're going to start with Fernanda. <laughs> uh, well, I think, um, uh, I think uh, the, the important thing to acknowledge always is the ecosystem. So I think, uh, I don't see there's, I think there's a false dichotomy between commercial and institutional because uh, they are very uh, entangled in so many levels, which I think it's very important is to draw a clear line uh, of like when the gallery finishes and the institutional begins. But uh, in Pivot, for example, we, we rely a lot in commercial galleries. We are very close to commercial galleries, but uh, we never had the gallery interfering in the content of a program, for example. So it's usually we work together to support an artist. So for example, like a, an artist that works in Pivot or an artist that, uh, the other, when we do a section is different that I can, I can explain after, but like talking about the <laughs> gallery involvement in Pivot, for example. So we usually do commissions in Pivot and we usually work with artists that are represented by commercial galleries. So uh, Pivot's budget is, uh, in many times uh, limited for the amount of space we have. So we always, uh, we, we always try not to say no to an artist in advance. So we ask an artist to, to create the project that they want to create for that space and that context. And we say, negotiate with them. It's like, well, we can go until here. Why not call your gallery? Let, let's get the gallery involved to get to the next point instead of adapting the project. Or to use some kind of like facilities of uh, helping shipping, helping a neighboring thing, helping travel costs, all sorts of things, which I think is very important. So there, there's, so there's yes. a, a financial component that the commercial gallery has to, what happens if the artist doesn't have a, a, a gallery that can sustain that? Uh, I think uh, we never invite an artist because he or she is in the gallery, but mm. if the gallery is there, um, it's, it's, they, we always ask them to the table and to discuss how to enable a project. And if the artist doesn't have a gallery, of course, we try to solve it differently through, I don't know, uh, corporate sponsors, patrons, <laughs> a lot. So it, it, I think every, every situation is tailored for, for that specific practice. So uh, what we try to do is to, to, to make the, the program viable is to combine artists that have more structures in order to support artists that have less to, to create a sort of balance. But mm. when working in, in art fairs, I think uh, there's other things involved because uh, every art fair has specific relationship to specific galleries. So I think it's more like a role of mediation in the sense of like trying to put together a program, an interesting program with the conditions that we are given with. So I think it's a, I would say a different, I don't know uh, if you agree with me, my colleagues, but I think it's, it's a different tool that you have to use to curate a section oh, that it is. Okay. So it's not like a thematic group show that you have the freedom to. So there's you, a you, you have, that, there's a lot of that there's a lot of uh, mediation between the, the fair organizers, the the artists, the galleries, and it's like we're juggling around with all these things, trying to put together something that makes sense commercially and conceptually, which is 
it's a it's a different uh, situation, I think, entirely. But uh, what about uh, Cosmin? Yeah. What about you? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's. Uh, um, well, I, I agree basically, like with, the, with 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 what Fernanda said, that it's important, you know, both to acknowledge certainly the complex ecosystem <laughs> and and the economies that that uh, support artist work and artist livelihood. Um, it's also important for uh, non-profit context, for institutions uh, and events to uh, have this very clear. Uh, distinction of their decision-making processes um, and and to to make it very clear that that is not determined by any direct commercial considerations or indirect systems of support you know like yeah. choosing an artist because there is a support coming from the from the commercial side and this comes and this is based on on different arguments i mean one is the a general sense of integrity and uh, uh, you know going a little bit back to my to my previous answer to again justify why we are uh, why we exist and why, why why do we do the things we do and that's because we want to put forward some ideas we want to um, enable artists to achieve uh, what they want to achieve uh, and that all this is done uh, completely independently from any consideration of a further uh, profit from those artistic objects so that's i think a very important point uh, but another one is also because of course there are other kind of hierarchies that come when you bring in the commercial world and there's galleries that have there's artists who don't work with galleries and and i think many of the artists we all uh collaborate with in in in, in this group don't actually uh, work with the gallery or uh, and, and among the ones that we do, many work with galleries that have uh, that are in a very different category of possibilities than other galleries. So, you know, we we all know of events and places where uh, this is allowed to to be visible, and and when that happens, I think the results are very uh, clear for everyone. Um, yes. And I think that's when. Uh, our system fails most. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, <laughs> um, what about you? Oh, sorry, sorry. Continue, continue. No, 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 no. I mean, that, that, that's basically it. I mean, again, this is not in any way to... Uh, um, to, 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 to think that the, the, the gallery system is somehow the enemy, you know, simply because they do the work of commerce, you know, which is which might be closer to the uh, overall capitalist system that, 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 you know, should indeed be the enemy in many ways. I mean, I think in that sense, we're, uh, you know, as, as far removed as many of the smaller and mid-sized galleries to the overall machine, and we're, we're, we're complicit in, in many other ways. So I, I don't think that's where the fight should be, ta should be taken. But again, that's not to say that, that, that clear integrity and independence in decision-making processes and, and, you know, in, in, in putting forward the program shouldn't happen. Hmm. Um, yeah, well, I, th I, con I consider many of the galleries also, remember when the, the galleries, the, the, that, um, they used to do clinics, they used to do the studio visit with the artist for hours and hours and, the, you know, talking about where do they think their work is going to go in and... So, but uh, that's why I was asking you about like the, the vessel, the, the gallery, the, gal mm. the, the old role of the galleries, you know, that sometimes now it, uh, it uh, you know, the other artists are making, like talking, you know, between each other about their works or reflecting on their own work. Then how do you feel about that with, I mean, you have a special relationship because you also have, a, you, you manage a, um, you know, a foundation, a private foundation, no? I think I agree with everything that Fernanda and Cosman were saying. Like our, our mutual friend Paul has this statement that I love, which he calls like keeping it clean. And you can immediately tell um, when someone pays to play, right? So like you can yes. immediately tell if a donation or something like this impacted the curatorial thinking. So yes, there needs to be integrity. 
And for me, it's very different from the rest of the panelists here because I also manage a collection. Um, but if, so when I'm talking to a gallery, the Diana is a curator producing work because we produce a lot of new work and we love producing new work. I love sharing ideas with artists, but if an acquisition were part of that discussion, it would probably dictate the size of something. It would dictate the complexity. Like it would, it would really get, actually get, if the, that end goal of, of a acquisition would kill the potential of what that work could be. So um, I think what I love in terms of working with galleries are, you know, when you build a team where we're here to support the artist. So of course we know limits and giving limits is really important in supporting people. Um, yes. But uh, it's, um, but yeah, it's there, Bangladesh, for example, I'll just give you some really simple logistics things. There is no art insurance in Bangladesh. So how am I able to show some of these artworks? It's because the galleries will insure the works for us because they know it's important to show it in this context. And maybe it doesn't make commercial sense, but it's again, how do we show this artist's work to a new audience? What is our role in developing the artist's career? The commercial side comes next. Yes, we do buy work, but they're separate conversations. And so it's a really um, delicate balance of trying to um, find that, if that makes sense. And you, Ben, it really inspire me when you talk, the way that I talk about supporting artists, you talk to me a lot about supporting galleries and you really, um, you know, changed or opened my mind to the importance of, of doing that. Um, because, I, you know, I can't be as good a curator without that support system. Um, and part of what we do also in DACA, because there aren't galleries that represent artists in DACA, is trying to build communities of gallerists who start representing those artists who are able to support them. Um, we don't get any kickbacks from that, um, but it's something that we do to support artists. So yes, it's an ecosystem and everything flows into each other. And again, integrity, I think, is that key word. Mm. And intention, You're integrity and intention. You remind me of uh, a conversation I had with Isa Lorenzo from Silver Lens that uh, they had a major um, a fire in one of their storage in uh, Manila and they basically had to design because there was no art insurance in, in Philippines. So they basically, are, Silver Lens was designing with the insurance company art insurance, uh, uh, an art insurance policy. So yeah, yeah, I understand where you're coming from, where there's, you know, no infrastructure. Aaron, let's see. <laughs> you... I mean, I think very similar to all of my colleagues. I feel the same way in relationship to galleries. Um, they're very much are part of the ecosystem. And, you know, at Delfina, they are part of the family. So not only as supporters, but also people we try to also build networks around. So we try, for example, to ensure that studio visits equally involve gallerists as much as it might involve uh, curators, um, because yes. I think we have a role to. We're bringing artists from all over the world to London, and we should be exposing these artists and exposing gallerists to different types of practices. So, and, and artists mm -hmm. that would normally get a chance to meet because they don't have time, you know, to in between art fairs to go and do many, many studio visits. But at Delfina, we bring 40 international artists to London every year. So I think it's our responsibility to introduce them to galleries as much as we do in terms of uh, institutions. But we never let galleries dictate uh, the program. Um, it's an advantage, of course, if an artist does have a gallery in the sense that maybe there's additional support we can uh, get for that artist, or we see how that artist is going to be supported after Delphina Foundation. So then the gallery will take up kind of the rest of that kind of like process, produce a work, commercialize it, and artists have to leave, live. And that's why I think that we have to really <laughs> work very yes. close to They have to live, they have to eat. And that's what an, a gallery is doing, a great benefit to an artist more than we can. So we need to do preparatory work in that way for them to kind of to live on. And I think it was saying in the context of Venice, um, it, it, it did not matter to me whether an artist had a gallery or not. If they did for the biennial, it was extremely helpful because then I could really argue at the gallery and say, no, you must support this because of course <laughs> being part of the Venice biennial is going to increase kind of their reputation. You're going to benefit as a gallery in order to make this happen. I need your support. And they support it in many different ways. But I will raise one kind of example with Venice uh, is that uh, I first saw this particular performance by Boy Child, which is in the Venice Biennale program, it was produced by a commercial gallery at first, Carlos Shishikawa. And so uh, oh. Vanessa Carlos staged a performance by this artist in, as part of Condo um, in January or whatever, I can't remember it was. But in any case, you know, so I, I actually found that performance work kind of through kind of the gallery. 
Um, she didn't propose it to us. I saw it. And then many months later, actually probably maybe a year later, uh, when I was invited to curate Venice, that performance came straight to my mind and I was able to put it into the program. Wow. So we have around 15 minutes left. Uh, we can go through the last question like this. And then hopefully we have some uh, questions and answers. We're going to try and go quickly. Um, the pandemic has put a huge stress on the most vulnerable of the world. And systemic racism has been brought to the world's political agenda again, because it's cyclical every so often they come back <laughs> because we don't solve it. Last week, Simpiwe Nzubi, um, um, South African artist, wrote, racism is a system, it is not an event. Um, and we know Africa was exploited to its minimum expression, uh, yet it was not only Africa, the colonies uh, were the playground of the European powers. Um, and, um, and as we were talking before, uh, native populations was completely decimated. Um, and on the other hand, we have these our market reports that say that we are the most diverse uh, workforce of the world, the art, the art workforce. Um, it does, it, it really, it's not true. I mean, in terms of maybe heteronormativity, it is, but not uh, in non minorities in non-genitorial genitorial, um, positions are, uh, I mean, we are not diverse in that sense. So we, we haven't been, we are making museums accountable, but we're, we're not, we haven't made um, uh, galleries, art dealers, art auction houses, fairs, um, publications, we haven't made them accountable of like how the diversity or, you know, um, of their workforce, um, um, you know, um, change that we really need. So Aaron, I, with all that we've worked with, with colonial narratives and, and, uh, I, and um, what has happened in the colonies, we are very, here in Europe, how come all this, all this that it's talk, we are talking about, how come museums haven't been, in, in Europe haven't, you know, or museums are all the art world, how come they're not, they, they're in space? Oh, I, well, <laughs> I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with there being unscathed. I think they're actually... Right, right, but they started everything, and you're like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I think there's a lot more we need to hold institutions to account kind of for kind of in Europe, you know, when, you know, the rioting and looting kind of took place around the most recent kind of Black Lives Matter. I just love the memes that came out of uh, kind of <laughs> Black Twitter uh, about how kind of, you know, of course, the property of many museums and galleries are from looting. So basically shut the F up, you know. <laughs> um, yes. But right now, there's a lot of conversations taking place. Trust me, like we have weekly calls among the arts community uh, here in London. A lot of it has been about kind of this most kind of recent kind of wave, kind of a protest and how people are angry. I'm angry and I'm tired of the same conversation about what are we going to do? We know what to do. We've had so many panels and coalitions and reports and reviews about this. Like, when are we gonna start effing acting on it? And, that, and that's, I think right now, it's like, it's kind of come to the forefront again, but I think there is a difference. There is a crack that's happened because the protests oh. continue here um, every weekend. There's some plan for this weekend. And what you see on the signs are things like, why aren't we taught colonialization in school? Why aren't we taught black history in school? And so going back to the basics in this country, it's kind of been eradicated, this history, this awful history that ties all of us who are on this call together, you know, because yes. we're in this formal, former kind of empire in that kind of way. Well, and I was thinking, I was thinking, uh, Diana, you're in a Dutch colony. Um, uh, <laughs> you're in an English colony. You're, you're in a Portuguese colony. I'm in an English and a Spanish. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, We're exactly. talking from a colony. You know, and so right now we're also thinking about, okay, what, I mean, the institutions are having a conversation about what they do. You know, of, of course, some are issuing statements, you know, and a statement is only going to go so far. It's about now issuing actions to kind of make, to act on those things, but also how we kind of also address the issue of class too, that also is very much part of this conversation, part of the problem in the art world too, not creating accessible routes for 
for kind of young people, for quote unquote minorities. Um, but anyway, but it, 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 the, the art sector here is not unscathed by this for sure. And there's gonna be a lot to come out of this because if you look throughout society here, there's you know as much systemic racism as you know there is anywhere yeah. else. Um, there's been police brutality. It, take, here. it takes many. It takes many forms, of course. Yeah, it takes many different forms. But I think what's been almost in a way, uh, what's uplifting now is going to the protests and seeing so many young people, so many non-black people. Um, yeah, but I, I want to see from the gesture to the action and change. I, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm with you. Like, like okay, when when are we starting the real thing? Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. And I, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll let the conversation come on and we can maybe... Yeah, can yeah. So, D Diana, you're in South and Southeast Asia. You, there's very, a lot of similarities with Americas. So how do you see that? Uh, because there's a lot of systemic ra racism in, in South and Southeast Asia mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I'm going to step back a bit and to say I'm actually from a place that's still a colony. So, like... Uh, Guam, for example, is a U.S. colony. My cousins can be sent to war by the U.S. military, but they can't vote for president. Like, it's uh, kind of ridiculous. So all of this stuff is very personal to me because that's the place I come from. But when we talk about class, that is a huge problem uh, in the art world, right? If internships aren't paid, how are you going to get a job in the art world? Like, unless, you know, you have those financial resources from your parents or... Um, Look at the way we're speaking English. Like, we're all highly educated. Like, what if you don't have those language skills? Um, so something that I really appreciate, um, and, you know, it's frustrating for some people, but, like, we started an institution from scratch. Like, Sajad, who's my right-hand man, like, I think is the first person in his family to go to college. Um, it's, uh, we're able to kind of build this from the bottom up. Like, it's maybe easier to start when you're doing something new and you're keeping this in mind, but we need much more class diversity. Um, Another thing is blackness means different things in different places. Um, and so, for example, in India, some Bollywood stars were going out about Black Lives Matter, but these are women who are the front page poster women for a fairness cream called Fair and Lovely. And when we talk about change, I am thrilled that yesterday Unilever, who owns the brand, is dropping the fair from the from the uh, product, so it's changing. Um, but we, uh, we convened a conversation between a, a black feminist, or black and non-white feminist collective in Rio uh, called Travoa with a group of female Bangladeshi artists, a collective um, that, uh, called Shako, and they had discussions about what blackness means. And so they're gonna be publishing a text about this, but looking at these very similar contexts. Um, same thing in Southeast Asia, like, cast right you can kind of tell someone's um class based on the color of their skin what their last name is and that's going to affect decisions for the rest of your life like it might be illegal but it's there so um i think it's important to consider again what blackness means to different places or if we even look at like um pan-african movements that that disconnect between the african-american experience and the africans on the continent and those in uh in uh Europe, it's, uh, it's different, but I think we need to find those commonalities and fight our struggles in our local context rather than, you know, social media posting stuff when you're not dealing with things in your own backyard. So, uh, Cosmin, um, there's a huge divide between East Asia lives one reality and South and Southeast Asia live another one. How do you see that, uh, the, the, you know, systemic racism in East Asia? Because that's a, there's another relationship with it, with complex with China, of course. Well, I think before talking about specificities, and of course there are uh, um, enormous uh, specificity as such, I think it's also important to first acknowledge that uh, the, the colonial condition was a global condition. And as a consequence of that, white supremacy is a global condition that affects in different way, but it, it does, it's, it's a presence that is global and it manifests in, in even in places that were not directly colonized by European power. So, uh, you know, white supremacy is a, a, a factor in many processes taking place in, 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 in Taiwan, for example. Um, but that being said, of course, being in Hong Kong, that's even stronger as, you know, with, with the exception of the few remaining colonies like, like, like Guam of, 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 of Diana, Hong Kong was, of course, the last large European colony to be relinquished in our lifetimes. 
Um, so um, obviously the, these issues and the re repercussion have a very direct um, meaning here. Now, of course, then there are all the many, many com complexities that you mentioned. And then there's, of course, the issue of uh, anti-black ra racism throughout Asia uh, in different places, manifesting in different ways. There are different um, narratives of racism and, and, and horizons of racism uh, towards Southeast Asians uh, in, in, in East Asia. There are uh, various uh, other hierarchies and, 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 and that, that uh, intermingle indeed class uh, and race. Uh, we did an exhibition a few years ago uh, after work that was somehow departing from the highly visible but completely invisible from, from any discourses uh, a community of migrant domestic workers in, in Hong Kong. It's also a, a reality wow. in Singapore uh, yeah. who are um, almost entirely Indonesian and, and Filipina women. Um, and one of the main uh, goals of the project was actually to talk about the issue of race in Asia. Uh, historically, uh, we also, uh, um, and, 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 and how it sort of like changed in media and popular culture, um, the issue of like black representation as well and, and in, 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 in popular culture, in, in, in advertising was, was something that we were looking at. Diana brought in the issue of, um, of, of, of uh, skin whitening creams and um, you know, in Southeast Asia, that there is certainly a, a desire for whiteness uh, and one that has deep historical roots was, 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 was certainly re reinforced during colonialism and it's, and it's continuously reinforced by uh, a certain ideal of, of, of whiteness. But it's also in many places, like again, reinforced now by the new horizon of, of, of Korean ideal of beauty. You know, so there's mm -hmm. yet another yeah. layer of, of, of um, Soft racist, yeah. racist aspiration and, and, and hierarchies mm -hmm. being uh, built and, and, and woven into. And, you know, in some cases, this comes as a soft power for uh, Korean uh, well, exploitation in many parts of Southeast Asia. There's also places, and it's not, we don't have time to get into details, but there's places where, uh, and, and actually some place in, in, in East Africa where, where, where this also comes as a, as a soft power for, for uh, uh, Chinese capital, you know, with, uh, as a consequence of a, of, of, of a strange uh, race projection and, 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 and association. So um, there are certainly all these complexities that one, we, one must uh, acknowledge and, and fight about, but this should not also, we shouldn't uh, be, we shouldn't lose ourselves in, in details and complexities uh, and, and forget the root cause of this. And that is the colonialism and exploitation, the genocide and, and, and slavery and the continuous perpetuation of that economic system by Europeans uh, and their settlers around the world. And, and that's basically uh, what we're talking about. Uh, mm. when, we, when we talk about these issues. So the last question, I am so happy we, <laughs> we arrived to you, Fernanda. You're based in Brazil. <laughs> that Brazil is a Latin American country with the biggest African descent population and with an important native population in this moment in peril. Um, because also, we're to, I mean, we, we talked about, you know, the native, uh, the indigenous popu local population that was decimated as well. So this is a huge question. Do you see tokenism as a threat or as an advantage for Brazilian art? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. But I think I also an important, important fact is that Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery uh, in the world. Mm. So, so it's like the situation that uh, I think uh, the only way to change anything uh, in Brazil or elsewhere is like we have to take time to rethink the inherited power structures that generate this kind of uh, social, like uh, endemic social injustice. So it's like, if you think about like uh, the global South, I think for, for a long time was, uh, was seen as a passive subject. And I think the only, uh, as something to be addressed and something to be brought into curatorial discourses as a, somehow a block. So like the, this population, this population, this population, and I think uh, the only way to, to change that and to act, as you say, this is to pass the microphone, is to create uh, the conditions for, for critical thinking and for inclusion to, to flourish and to, and to, and to, 
to really change the, the ground. It's not enough to, to have like a, one black artist included in a program of an institution to say, okay, check that, okay, check the LGBT, check the black, check the indigenous, which is something that we see uh, is happening a lot. So I think uh, for in, our, in our case, uh, in Pivot, we never did something that uh, discursively addressed that, but uh, we started first of all in the office, like to, to really see how our team photo looked like. So like, it's something that it's, it's completely uh, crucial to any sort of change and to really work horizontally to everybody working in the team to ask questions, to ask questions that sometimes we take for granted. As Diana was saying that, um, that uh, with, with all this stuff, uh, speaking English is, is something that is completely related to class in, in, and whiteness in oh, Brazil, so. for example. So, uh, mm. And sometimes we, we talk in the art world as if everybody speaks English and, and this is something that should be like completely dismantled and decolonized in the way that we address the subject matter. Even like the, the, as we were discussing before, the very use of the word tokenism in your question is something that is related is related to a, to a group that has a specific uh, uh, toolbox to, to unveil this. So I think, uh, of course, uh, I think as workers in the art field, uh, the ethics and everything we're saying throughout the panel is that uh, we need to advocate towards complexity. And uh, it's, not, it's not about uh, being didactic, it's not about using the word inclusion in a very um, easy way, I would say, but actually to for us that are in a position of power to really sit down, listen, pass the microphone and learn more, like to, to learn from rather than, uh, than address things that uh, to, to try to again to include uh, this discussion in another folder and to, to, to really, I think for me, just to, to, to sum it up because I know uh, the time is short, is yeah. I think that the way to start this is through language, it's like is to address in new terms, is to really thinking about it the use of every word we use in what context and how. So I think, uh, yeah, let's see. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's go to, we have some questions. Uh, one of them, I think it's a question, but I think it's also an expression of desire. And I think I agree with that question. Leopold Monis Casson says, do you have mm -hmm. any plans for a joint global action? So I'm not gonna make a question. I want to say, I want, <laughs> a plan for joint global action, all of, all of us, all of you. Um, Felipe Melo asks, uh, even if, with all the discussion about inclusion, the art world is still profoundly exclusive and in general somehow averse to popular mass culture. What is the key action on each of you of your views to revert this beyond bringing up the discussion? I think we can start with, I mean, Diana, <laughs> You've tackled that like straight on with the Dark Art Summit. Yeah, tackle, but it's it's an ongoing thing, right? It's like, you know, duck, <laughs> the population size. So I think open calls are very important, but I've, I saw a hole in this open call. Like, so open call means that anyone can submit their work and someone will look at it. But is the language of that open call intimidating? So, uh, for example, mm. um, I came across this absolutely brilliant young indigenous painter in Chittagong. Amazing work. And um, her English isn't great. So my amazing assistant, uh, Ruxmini, spoke to her. Why did she not apply for the prize? Oh, because the application was in English and she didn't feel um, comfortable. Yeah. So I think it's also like being humble and taking feedback and just being, okay, I have to change if I want to be inclusive. How do I reach these people? The other thing, um, I encourage you all, like, um, so we started this initiative called Art Around the Table, which is a, um, these kind of art workshops for kids and families. Um, and the current one that we launched today, which you can find on the Samdani Art Foundation um, Facebook or on our Instagram account is with a group of village kids who made a puppet theater and they're kind of laughing about all the city kids that are doing their zoom or internet lessons so like dude we don't got a TV we don't have internet but you know we've got fish and we've got books and we can do this like actually not everyone has the digital access that we do so um, it's it's again trying when you think about inclusion not everyone has our language skills not everyone speaks the same language. You, know, you have to be more open. Yeah. It's also about like different forms of intelligence. Some people cannot speak about their work. That's okay. So how do you, how do you create a platform that can, um, I don't have an answer for it, but it's what I'm working towards. So anyone else wants to pitch in? 
before we close? No? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're gonna, we are past the time. So thank you so, so much. I admire you so much. It was an honor to talk to you tonight. Thank um, you. It was really thank uh, you. just to acknowledge you. your work and 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 yes, yes you know of, of of you know doing so thorough doing the, such a thorough preparation and and you know research in, into our work and 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 uh, and reading I adore it all you. together. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't happen so often with moderators and 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 uh, that's really, true. I think that there, there needs to be a, a a big acknowledgement and thank you for your uh, contribution. I I have to say I was intimidated. <laughs> Come please, on. please oh, don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vinny is our next collector in residence at Delfina. So we're looking forward to working um, over there. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, he's gonna make me cook. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna Just switch to Spanish you. to say goodbye to everybody in Argentina in Spanish. Uh, goodbye to everybody in English now. Uh, muchas gracias. A, todo, a cada uno de ustedes por compartir sus miradas y a todos y todas los que nos acompañan en este tercer encuentro del Open Forum, el live stream de Arteba. Los esperamos el próximo viernes para el último encuentro de este programa que va a ser con directores de bienales y vamos a ver qué pasa con eso. Eh, muchísimas gracias a todos. Buenas noches.